and I'm confident in my ability to handle whatever it takes. You know, I, that's been always said before that, um, hey, you know what, grow your confidence and your confidence will increase your capacity. You're tuned in to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 742, with today's guest, Wrenchy Matt Erlin. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I founded Whistlekick because I love martial arts and I wanted to meet other martial artists and make some cool martial arts products. And that's what we did. And that's why we're here. And that's how you're listening to us right now. If you want to know all the things that we've got going on, because it's a long list and you would get annoyed at the length of that intro if I told you about all of them, just go to whistlekick.com and poke around. We update it constantly. We're adding new things all the time. So if you haven't been there in a while, go check it out. And if you find something in the store that you want to pick up and support us, use the code PODCAST15. Martial Arts Radio gets its very own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, because no one's ever accused me of naming things in a weird way. We keep it simple. The show comes out twice a week, and the whole reason we do this show is to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists worldwide, no matter what style, no matter how old, no matter what your political background, anything. Martial arts makes people better, and that's why we do what we do, and that's why we invest so much of our time and energy and money into fostering the traditional martial arts. If you want to help the show and our company do those things, there are lots of ways you can help out. You could make a purchase. You could follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick everywhere. You could join our Patreon, patreon.com slash whistlekick. You can get in as little as two bucks a month. The more you're willing to contribute, the more we're going to give back to you. And I know we're doing a great job with it because people very rarely stop their Patreon contributions. In fact, more often than someone stopping are people upping their contribution. So uh, we're constantly looking at new ways, as with everything, to make it better. And I'm proud of what we offer there as well as everywhere. I'm proud of what we do. If you want that full list of everything that we do, from the free to the paid and the ways that you can help us out, go to the family page, whistlekick.com slash family. I had the pleasure to meet and train with and even teach today's guest back in April at our first ever all-in weekend. There are people who step into a room and very quietly shift the energy. Wrenchy Erlin is one of those people. I was so thankful to have him there. I learned as much working with him as I think he learned from me. I had a great time. And I knew it was just a matter of time before we had him on the show. And here we are. And it was a great conversation. I was super excited. But I have to say, it didn't go where I expected it to. You'll see what I mean shortly. So how are things? Oh, you know what? Things are well. Life is good. Life is good. Um, uh, obviously, not without peaks and valleys. When I, right. so, um, so my daughter, uh, I have th- we have three kids. My wife and I have three kids. And, um, and uh, our eldest is nine and a half. Our daughter is five and a half. And then, or sorry, our, yeah, our eldest is nine. And then five and a half year old daughter. And then um, two and a half year old son. And so busy family, busy household. Uh, well, this most about two weeks ago, actually, is when my daughter, uh, she has special needs. And so mm. she had to undergo a hip surgery. Oof. And uh, yeah, it, and she's in a full body cast for, oh. yeah, full body cast for six weeks. And, um, and, and at um, that age, oh, man, yeah, you can't yeah. get a kid to that age to sit still under normal circumstances. It must be like vibrating with frustration. Well, what's interesting is actually because. Um, because of her syndrome um, that she's diagnosed with, it's a rare chromosomal abnormality called a uh, pallister killian mosaic syndrome, PKS okay. for short. Okay. And um, so with that, she's at this age, nonverbal and nonmobile. So mm, uh, okay. she doesn't crawl, she doesn't walk. Um, wow. But what she would, it's crazy. So what she was doing was she was popping her hips out of socket is what would happen because they could just easily slip out yeah. and she would laugh about it right so she <laughs> she can make certain sounds yeah I'm that's like, such a kid thing <laughs> like, yeah, like, like consequences like, be damned my body does this weird thing i'm gonna do it yeah totally right and we're like you know <laughs> um my wife and i are like oh my gosh right and so like here we are with the orthopedic surgeon during one of her appointments and we can, he's like, yep, I can, I can pop it back in. I'm, I'm shifting it. And then it, it seems to be coming out. 
And, uh, and we're watching him do this and we're like, oh my goodness. And she's just like giggling and laughing and we're like, um, okay, whatever, you know? <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, now since the surgery, it's been, you know, two weeks that she's been in that body cast. We've got, we've got our flow mom and I, and, uh, as well as she, she's more comfortable with the cast and, oh, that's good. and, um, and so she has hopefully only four more weeks left in that cast. And then, and then I'll hopefully she'll be out of that, which I'm told at that point, okay, transitioning out of the cast, it's going to feel a little bit painful. So mm. we don't know what that looks like, but then after that, um, then we need to do the right hip too. So oh. <laughs> yeah, we're like, so life's good. Things are busy. Things are crazy. Like I said, not without ups and downs, but uh, um, all in all, uh, we count it all joy. Yeah. 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 Yep. You know, it, it, and, and I'm, and I'm curious, you know, mar one of the things I like to say is martial artists, you know, we, we have a, a more diverse toolbox to pull from and life throws things our way it do you have anything in the toolbox for this um you know well yes um you know i'm a firm believer that god puts uh and i'm a person of faith right so whether sure. someone believes in god or not is, is, is irrelevant um in this particular context but i believe that people come into your life for a reason a season and a lifetime Mm -hmm. right uh it's not by happenstance that you know we got connected up and whatnot and sure. in, in my opinion and and so a handful of years ago um it, it's not like i grew up with you know a brother or sister that had special needs or anything like that however um you know of course i was aware of of uh children uh and people with um certain challenges um but when we started undergoing our situation because we had no clue no clue whatsoever that um, our daughter had any kind of challenge whatsoever. Um, and it was a wild ride. I mean, we just thought we were having a premature baby. Uh, she mm -hmm. was born at 35 weeks. So even then, 35 weeks, it wasn't that yeah, um, early on. Um, but then we just went through this this craziness in, in 20, 2016 when she was born. And and uh, it was in, she was in pretty much the hospital, which... Um, she was in the hospital, which is 70 miles one way um, away from where we live. Um, and so this, when she was born, it was during the flu season. So like her older brother uh, was asking us questions on why he couldn't go see and meet his baby sister while she was in the hospital for eight weeks. And that's because during the flu season, right, they don't allow anybody under 12 in the NICU is where she was for a period of time. So, so craziness. But I share all that uh, because as we were going through our situation, as we still continue to go through our situation, there's just, just this overwhelming sense of just peace and understanding like, hey, this is what we do. This, we just go through this. Like mm -hmm. you just, um, you, you make lemonade out of lemons. And, there, and, and I think not only why we're able to do that um, because of our personal faith, but also because a handful of years before that, um, one of our very best friends, um, he's a, he's a mentor of mine. And, uh, so he's 20 years older than me, but he went through a double lung transplant. Yeah. So he grew up with cystic fibrosis and he grew and because he's 20 years older than me, you know, he's in his, uh, mid fifties. Uh, and so at the time he was growing up, he was in and out of the hospital, a cold would turn into pneumonia like that. Mm. Uh, matter of fact, doctors would tell his mom, Hey, don't get used to the kid. You know, I mean, it, it was, it was pretty, it was pretty cutthroat, pretty hardcore. They wouldn't even call him by his name. It was harsh. Ooh. It was harsh. And, um, and so this was a time when, you know, children were, um, that had cystic fibrosis typically wouldn't live past their thirties. So, um, but what was interesting is he got, he met somebody, a mentor and he, and the guy was in his fifties and he, and so my friend, his name is Aaron asked him, what did you do to be, have a long successful life? And so he had a, basically he was given a playbook, a game plan. Um, anyhow, just through circumstance events and, uh, the mortgage meltdown crisis back in, you know, 27, or sorry, uh, 2007, 2008, um, he basically worked himself down. He didn't follow that game plan. And then that's what caused him to 
um, mm. get really ill and, and the lungs just deteriorate. And so, but going through that double lung transplant, I saw, I watched him, I watched his wife go through that and um, just their grit, their tenacity, their perseverance through that. And that was a real life example for me of how it is to push through and persevere. And so for me personally and my wife, as we were going through our situation and we were like, okay, we have no reason to complain and cry and why whine and say, God, why is this happening to me? Oh, woe is me. You know, we had no, we had no excuse to sit in, in our opinion, to sit in the corner and, and in the fetal position and wet all over ourselves. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we said, you know what, this is what we're going to do because what was interesting enough is while while we were at you know a a well known children's hospital here in the Los Angeles area, while we were there, in in the midst of our challenge and our struggle, we were always put around. God always put ar- us around other people, other parents, other children that had it way worse than us. We had asked them like, "Hey, how long have you guys been here? We've been here for eight weeks." They're like, "We've been here for eight months," and I'm like, "Oh my goodness." So, yeah. So, I mean, is there a playbook? No, (laughs) (laughs) but, uh, you know, I guess, you know, going through martial arts and just understanding that, uh, Hey, you know what? You go into like a sparring match with a game plan, but that game plan quickly changes. (laughs) But you, you know what I'm hearing and the, the most concrete example for me of this has nothing to do with martial arts. It's in running and, and the four minute mile. Yeah. When Roger Bannister broke the four minute mile, everybody said, nobody can do this. Mm-hmm. And then he did it. And then all these other people did it because now they knew it was possible. And so you talk about the struggle of eight weeks, but you see that there are people who have been able to walk this path for eight months. That when we go to our black belt test or competition or whatever the difficult thing is, because we know other people have gone before us, it is possible. And if we know it's possible and we believe in ourselves enough, we can do it. Absolutely. Wow. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I'm a, I heard this quote a while back and it just resonated with me. Maybe it's just my personality or I don't know what it is, but maybe a combination of everything. But the, the quote is too tough for you. It's just right for me. Mm. Like, again, it's just this, like, um, this, 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 um, this, just this grit, right. This, this, just tenacity, this fire that's inside you that just says like, all right, like I can weather the storm. I'm a, I'm a push through, right? Like, yeah, I don't know. For whatever that's worth <laughs> what's the what's the cl- cliche i think it's from a poem or something calm seas don't make for skilled sailors right right and and something similar i, I once heard um tough times create strong people yeah. strong people create good times good times create weak people weak people create tough times I was Tough just time. talking about this with somebody yeah like in the last week. Yeah, it, it it's it's a cycle that I think we're we're probably all doomed to participate in. But it's so powerful. Oh, absolutely. Isn't it? Like, you know, we think about it in the context of martial arts and there are if if you've been part of a school and it's probably easier to see as a participant than an instructor, but maybe not. But I think about periods of time that I watched in various schools that I, I was a student and it's not always the same intensity. So there, there are, there are ups and downs and you see the students that join during the really difficult times. And you see the students that join during the easier times and they are not the same student. Right. Mm. You have a school, right? Yeah. How did, and you had a school when, when your daughter was born? Yes. How did you manage those two things? 
Mm, yeah. Um, I don't even know, to be honest. <laughs> 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 because, cause, so, you know, um, so I have a school. My wife and I also own an, an online um, company. Um, where we deal with basic commodities in, in multiple different areas, anyhow. Mm-hmm. And then I also worked uh, a day job at that time, and my wife also worked full time. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm laughing from both the recognition of the insanity as well as the understanding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, I mean, and then of course we were already parents, right? So we had, and our eldest, he was three and a half at the time. Mm. Um, all in all, I honestly don't know how we did it, but somehow, somehow we did, right? Um, now granted, my, with my school, like it's, it, I'm not, I'm not a, I'm not a six day a week type of school. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, and at the time I didn't have nearly as many students as I have now. Um, but, I think, if, I mean, regardless, you know, um, I I just think that um, when you're when you have, as I alluded to earlier, when you have the the mindset of like, okay, I'm gonna do whatever it takes, and I'm confident in my ability to handle whatever it takes, then it increases your capacity, hmm. right? Um, you know, that's been always said before that, um, Hey, you know what, grow your confidence and your confidence will increase your capacity. And, um, uh, and so I remember, um, yeah, when I was working, I think one of the things that helped, like, as far as structurally was I, where I worked for my day job, um, I had to be in by like 6am. So, um, and then luckily, you know, living in the great state of California, you have certain, certain abilities to, you know, uh, take time off, whatever. And, and so that's really what happened. I really leveraged, you just started to figure out where you can leverage, um, you know, like whether it's, you know, pay time off or, or, uh, FMLA, right. Family and medical leave absence, all that kind of stuff. And, mm-hmm. and, um, luckily with all the other quote irons in the fire, uh, other streams of income, I was able to, you know, say, okay, yeah, that's fine. Um, you know, we're going to, my wife and I were, were, were good with budgeting and, and being financially, uh, being good with our money. So I was able to basically say, okay, yeah, we'll go ahead and take those, you know, three weeks off. I'm going to take those three weeks off here, uh, non-paid or whatever. Right. So as far as structurally concerned, like we were able to just navigate that way, but, um, all in all, like, how did I keep consistent with teaching? I think for me personally, um, cause I, it could have been very easy for me to say, all right, guys, we're gonna, I, I'm not going to be here for a while. And because I'm the sole instructor, the main instructor at that time, um, uh, we're just not going to have classes for a while. Um, I could have easily said that and no one would have faulted me for that, obviously. Um, but I personally was not going to do that. That wasn't even an option on the table. Um, because for me, one, I needed it for my own personal sanity. Mm. Um, I needed to teach because, you know, you know, any of us that have taught for any length of time, we know that, Hey, we don't, we don't teach. Um, I mean, yes, we're given something away, but we're also getting something back. And, and I'm not talking about monetary value, monetary gain. I'm talking about like something that's just different in our soul, right? For those of us that love to teach, that enjoy teaching, when we see that new student and they light up when they finally get a technique that they've been struggling on or, or you know, a concept finally clicks for them, then um, that right there is what feeds our soul and feeds mm-hmm. our spirit, at least for me personally. So um, I needed a sense of normalcy during that time. I needed to take my eyes off myself and put it on other people. Um, so it, it was a little bit of a quote unquote selfish reason why I continued to teach and that, but that was purely for my own, um, spirit and soul. I found myself because I, I was, because martial arts is a way of rejuvenating, um, me, um, even though it's something that you're very active in, right? Yeah. Um, I found that my wife and I were 
inspiring and actually trying to um, uh, encourage my extended family members that were coming to us with worry about our situation. It's kind of funny, like we're in our situation, but they were like, oh, and, and um, I have, as you know, I'm half Korean, half Filipino. So um, my Korean side was coming up to me. Oh, Matthew, Matthew, oh, oh, are you okay? Are you okay? I'm like, yeah, we're fine. Are you okay? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, we're, we're going to be good. We're going to be good. Like it, it's good. Like you're all, we're all good. Yeah. Mm. It was funny. It, if I had a time machine, I could go back and talk to your students from that time. What would they say about how you were and how classes were during those first few months where you're splitting time with the hospital and, you know, trying to figure it all out? Um, some of the, some of the students, my, many of the students that were with, with me at that time are still with me today. Um, and, uh, and I think one of the things they had, they would say is that, um, one, my instructor truly cares, right? Obviously they call me sensei Matt. Um, so they're like, oh, sensei really cares. Sensei is loyal. Sensei is committed. Sensei is intense. <laughs> Um, were you more intense during that time? Um, I wouldn't say I'm more, I was more intense that time. I think it's just the example of going through that. Um, I I would say they would, they would say that I was intense, Hmm. not, not that I'm like intense with them, but just the sheer fact of like going through that and then staying in it. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think they would say that like, Cause that, I mean, that's, it was a pretty big situation to, and it's, yeah, it was a pretty big situation to kind of go through, you know, um, you, 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 you gotta be, you got, you gotta be crazy intense to kind of just keep that going, <laughs> especially when you, in a way don't have to. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Wow. Does your wife train or did she at any point? <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, did I step into something? <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I, I, I laugh at that because um, I think she did like maybe a three month city rec league course, right? Um, and then she was like, yeah, no, this is not, this is not for me. And then um, I remember one time, I think this is before our first our, our eldest was born and I was just like hey look look there's times where I, you you don't need to take a class but I just I need to show you some things you you need to know some things just in case and so you know I had a little little home gym in, in a, one of our bedrooms at that time and so I was like hey let's go ahead and just work on some things right some self-defense techniques and some scenarios and it got because I'm <laughs> I'm very much of a I like to teach real world as much as sport martial arts, right? Traditionally, I like to hybrid three concepts, right? Um, we would do some self-defense scenarios, you know, like a typical, like, hey, what happens if you get pinned against the wall, right? So, you know, someone's choking you. So here I am, the, I'm intense. And, and um, she was like, I can't, I can't do this. Like, no, this, this is, no, this is a little too real, right? When you think about it, her husband is, pinning her against the wall trying to quote unquote show her some martial arts techniques yeah. it it could lead to other situations real fast and so <laughs> <laughs> um so at that point now i have since gotten better right I, yeah, i've since gotten better with that and um we just we're on two different wavelengths when it comes to training um and like i'm the kind of guy that like okay i need to break a sweat i need to like i need to be intense work hard you know all that kind of stuff and be like Arr! and she's like i just want to go look at flowers you know <laughs> and um it's uh it's a funny dynamic that we have it's great and uh and uh we're high school sweethearts and so we've been together for um 20 years now as of this point um and uh but we've been married for 12 mm-hmm. and uh yeah so anyhow uh but no she 
she, she doesn't train, although she does know some things based off of what she's seen me teach in class or what she's seen me work on and things like that. So, yeah, she doesn't know. She doesn't know karate or karate, but she knows crazy. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, how did how did you get started? You you must have been someone like me, who just almost from the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so I got inspired with martial arts at seven years old, and I say inspired because I saw my father doing it, um, and uh, he trained in Tangsudo specifically. Um, so um, I remember seeing him do that for the first time oh and i'm like oh dad i want to do it and he said no you're not ready what do you mean i'm not ready right i'm seven years old right no i want to do it It looks cool it's fun right i assume that's stuff that i said and um he's like no you're not ready and so he made me wait for two years and then i started my martial arts journey at like nine and a half um, but during that time block, he was training. And so he would go to the studio and I would go with him and I would sit there and I'd watch their classes and I'd watch him do something. I watched the instructor teach something. And then at the facility the, in the bathroom, they had a full length mirror. So I remember seeing a technique and then as best I could. Well, and then what I do is I go into the bathroom and as best I could try looking in the mirror, duplicate that same technique. Mm. And I, I mean, usually at, you know, seven years old, you don't really remember too much, but for some reason I remember that. And, um, so finally at nine and a half, dad, you know, mom, dad, can I do martial arts? And he's like, all right, yes, you're good. You're Yeah. We'll go ahead and get you a martial arts. And I just started in a, you know, city rec program, but not which, um, you know, my, my instructor had multiple black belts, one of which was in judo, but, you know, in, in, in karate as well. I don't know what style or anything like that. He trained in Japan, of course, with the judo practitioners and all that kind of good stuff. So, um, but it was just, that was, man, that was it for me. Like mm -hmm. once I, once I got in that first class, I'm like, cool. My brother started with me. My, one of my best friends at that time started with me, but again, they started for different reasons. Mine was deeper because yes, there's something fun for me to do, but I saw it as a way for me to also connect with my father. Mm. Um, and so that's, that's why I, I can, I can play three, di three different instruments. I had, I had a band growing up. So that's also why I um, do music is because it was a way for me to connect with my father, music and martial arts are my big things. Okay. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to the music. Have you had a conversation with your father at any point about why he made you wait? Um, yeah. And he honestly doesn't remember. <laughs> really? Um, I think he, I think he said, you know, I, I, I don't know. I just, uh, I just had it in my gut feeling is what he said. It was just was something in my gut feeling. I just, yeah. Which is interesting because fast forward, um, my parents are no, aren't, aren't together. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're divorced. And my dad has since remarried and, uh, and he has two young kids. Um, and so I have kid siblings and one of my kid siblings, I believe he's like five and a half. Um, yeah, as of right now, he's yeah somewhere around five and a half, almost six. Now that I think about it, uh, he's almost six. And so, um, I asked my father, you know, like, and, uh, actually my, my dad's wife, right. My stepmom is, is, um, you know, talking to me and, and about, oh, you know, when's it, when do you, when did you get your son started? Right. When did I get my son started? And, you know, just trying to get a gauge there. And, you know, I'm asking my dad, like, you know, when are you going to put, you know, Max, my kid brother, when are you going to put him in, in martial arts? When are you going to get him started? He's like, mm, I'll show him some things. Just not yet. Not yet. I don't know. Not yet. I just, it's, it's just doesn't feel right. So I would assume based off of that experience that that is similar to how he was with me. Is he still training? Uh, Your father? Well, not that I'm aware of. I mean, my stepmom will say that he probably throws some, you know, kicks here and there. He'll walk around. They live in Oklahoma. 
And so I'm told that you know, there's been a couple of times he'll walk around the house in his uniform. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, and, and you know, so throw some that's such a dad thing, Regar- <laughs> regardless of, of martial arts, right? Like, like we mm-hmm. can all picture dad, like, like putting on whatever the thing was from a while ago, you know, could have been like a retired police officer, firefighter, EMT. I just want to see if it still fits. You know, just yep. walk around the house. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. No, absolutely. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, there was a period of time where I wasn't regularly training or active. And, you know, you know, when you're 18, 19 years old, you think one, you think you know everything. And mm. two, you think you're like the fittest ever like that. You oh, know, of course. you can, you can eat cake and drink soda and, you know, just chow down a whole bunch of burgers and fries you know, load it up and you think that, uh, you know, though it doesn't catch up to you. <laughs> so I remember being probably, you know, definitely early twenties. I think I was like 21, 22 or 20, 21 and being at the heaviest I was ever. Um, and trying to put on my uniform and my belt. And I was like, Hmm, this is getting a little shorter. <laughs> How did my, when did my belt shrink? Exactly. Why did my belt shrink? Why did my uniform shrink? What is going on? And then I said, yeah, no, this is not happening. And so um, there's a few things that led to inspiring me and motivating me to get back on track with my health. So that way I I live a long, you know, long, long life, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Okay. The two most important questions that come up on the show are why did you start and why have you continued? Mm. We talked about why you started. Why have you continued? Um, I'm very much of a lead by example type of person. And uh, so I've like my eldest, his, his name is Matthew as well, uh, Matthew Tobias. And um, we, I continue to train because I'm a sensei. Because as we know, the word sensei means the one who has gone before. And um, because I'm a lead by example type of person, I am going to, if I expect my students to be active and train and practice, then I need to model that. Um, People kids adults people they don't hear what you say they watch what you do and um i i don't want to be one of those instructors that say oh back in the day when i used to regularly train or back in the day when i used to compete or anything like that no i i i get inspired by those that have gone before me those that are older than me that are continuing to train or or just do what they do. And maybe the training schedule doesn't look as rigorous as when they were younger. Uh, Mine, um, I wasn't, I was going to say mine doesn't look as rigorous, but that's not entirely true. Um, I find myself that the older I get, the more focused, sorry, let me rephrase. The more mature I get in my martial arts journey, the more focused my training is. Um, when I was younger, I didn't practice all too often because I let my, I, I just kind of wrote on talent. Um, cause I was, you know, I'm like, oh, I got the natural skill in this. And so, you know, I was always one of the top students in my class. Um, so I'm like, oh, right, cool. And then you, of course you get around as you, <laughs> as you know, being an adult black belt going to competitions, you realize everyone is just as good as you, if not better. And so you're like, you have this, like, a you're eating a little bit of humble pie and you're realizing, oh, I got to step up my game. And so, um, so again, I mean, I know this is a long answer to, you know, what's well, a good question actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, uh, and, and so I just know that um, seeing my son practice martial arts, which my wife and I um, never made him do martial arts. We were just going to expose it to him, mm-hmm. and and if he wanted to grab a hold of it, fantastic. But we were going to support him in in whatever sport or activity he wanted to do. Um, and so martial arts has been a, a big one for him. And uh, our youngest one, Lucas, 
who's two and a half will uh, constantly come into class and, uh, and, and he'll try to do some of the techniques. And I mean, he knows his front kick. I tell him punches. He'll do his punches. I tell him, you know, show me your side kick, right? Turn sideways, body sideways. And he turns his body sideways, gets his leg up sideways. I'm like, this is really good for most, you know, his motor skills and, you know, and uh, anyhow, but it's as one of those situations again, like with our eldest, that we're not we're not forcing him to do it. We're just exposing it to him, and um, and for that reason, especially if they're going to take hold of it, then um, I want to model what it looks like to work hard mm-hmm. for what you want, and. Um, even um and it's just that mindset of do things even when you don't feel like doing it there are days where i don't feel like training like for my own personal self there are days where you know but there are days where you don't feel like doing the responsibilities of an adult (laughs) Mm -hmm. but we do it right but we do it anyhow most of them you know right exactly it's that phrase right oh i got an adult today i'm adulting Mm. And I'm like, mm, youth is wasted on the young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. yeah, it's 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 just a way to inspire and 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 motivate other people. It's just the best way that I know how. The only way I know. You, you've talked about a couple of mentors. I believe that was the word you used. Books you looked up to, mm-hmm. and what they've done for you. Who do you look to, look up to in the martial arts? Oh man. Um, You know, um, one that has always come to mind, um, one that does come to mind are Jackie Chan and Jet Li, right? You know, you're, you're big ones, of course. Um, yeah. and, and this is why, because, I mean, the, like, it, it's for the way, as far as the movies are concerned, the way they would do their martial arts in the movies, I just love the way they moved. I mean, I was the kind of guy, I was the kind of kid, let alone adult, that during fight scenes in movies, I would actually... If I had the opportunity to pause, you know, rewind and, and, you know, watch over again, I would do that because I was studying their movement. I was studying the way they moved um, and, and, and just taking up from them and seeing, okay, how could I incorporate that into my own, own martial arts style, my own, my own self. Um, but I love the, like, I've heard so many stories and 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 chatted with people who have worked with you know people like Jackie Chan, where they are some of the most kind-hearted, gracious, energetic, um, attracting people. Mm. Like and then like you've seen like Jet Li in his movies, it, at least in the earlier days, like he was always like this kind of like I would look at him as like the intense martial artist compared to Jackie Chan, which you know Jackie Chan still intense but just amazing with the skill and uh would just um but you know there was a comedic aspect and he always, and he got hit too so i like the realism behind that um but with jet lee intense in his movies and then in the interviews nicest guy ever i'm like that's cool and then um donnie yen is another one i'm like super cool i don't know if maybe it's just because of the Ip man movies but i just always would see him be this stoic fighter this yeah. emotionless right he just had like this peace and confidence about him now whether that's just hollywood or that is who he is um it, uh, you know i guess it's irrelevant i just that was something that was really cool for me i'm trying to think of other martial artist right now but those are the three that come off the top of my head those are three big names yeah three people that that i personally enjoy and look up to in various ways you know jackie chan i grew up in maine so friends we would go to opening night of you know rumble in the bronx yeah and nobody else was there so we are, you know, we are all over the place in the theater, you know, jumping around and and acting it out as it's coming up on the screen. And then, you know, as I got older, Jet Li and, and understanding 
the importance of his personal philosophy of spirituality and how that made an impact on not only who he was, but his views on martial arts. And then Donnie Yen, in a sense, I, I, I don't want to overstate this, but I feel like I know him a little bit because I've, I've been able to spend some time with his family mm. and, and just get to know him through other people and realizing that he, his, his upbringing wasn't that far off from what so many of us had. He just took it, ran with it, and had a good roll of the dice. Wow. Not not to, you know, understate his work ethic for sure. Right, right. So good choices. Yeah. Another one um, that comes to mind is uh, Superfoot, Bill yeah. Wallace. Mm -hmm. Because I love the fact that he's still active, you know, and and uh, and I love like I don't know. I, I just for me, a humble spirit, and of course, you know, you're familiar with <laughs> yes, Master Wallace, obviously, <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, but just the general sense. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting him just yet, but um, maybe someday uh, I will be able to. But um, just uh, in the interviews I've seen, in the way in seminars I've seen him, you know, um, teach or whatever, um, just an energetic, humble spirit. And that's and that's who he is. I mean, and that's so cool. And, you know, I, I, I've only known him for six years, but when I talk to people, he hasn't really changed that much. Right. He's, he's Bill. He's still Bill. And I don't call him by his, his first name in that way to, to disrespect him, you know, when I'm with him and when it's appropriate, you know, titles and, uh, and all that. Absolutely. Absolutely. But if you, if you know him, anybody who knows him knows exactly what, it, what I mean when I say it's Bill. The, the, as you were, as I asked you the question and you were answering my question, I was thinking about it myself. And mm. His name was the first one that I would, I would put on the list because not of what he's accomplished as <laughs> remarkably impressive as it is, but who he has remained being, who he is, how he shows up, the fact that he still continues to do what he does and inspire and share and Something that a lot of people don't realize is the efforts that he goes through to continue to improve and to make himself and what he teaches better. Mm, that's so awesome. In his mid-70s. Yeah, I love that. That's awesome. And it's something that I think we can all aspire to. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now you mentioned earlier and, and and i know from the name of your school that you you value tradition you value sport you value uh real world applicability mm -hmm. of martial arts hence the name of your school has it always been that way um as long as i've had my school yes um Growing up, I think I was in a very sport mindset. You know, like, all right, I'm going to do this kick to score a point. Okay, I'm going to do this punch to score a point. You know, I practiced with some friends that had maybe had a little bit of martial arts background. And, and I was like, boom, I scored a point. I win, right? And I'm a, I'm a very competitive person. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, even when I'm driving on the freeway here in California, people don't know I'm racing them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but hey, you know what? Secret race, secret race, and I'm winning. So, uh, right. <laughs> um, but uh, and, and I mean, I, and I grew up, I grew up playing baseball as well as doing martial arts, and mm -hmm. um, yeah. But I remember, I remember having already been a second dawn by this point, and having a little bit of, you know, self reflection, just really like asking myself 
uh, I was, I think in my late teens by this point, like, yeah, 18, 19 years old, something like that. And asking myself, could I really defend myself and the wolves that I loved? And I did not like the fact that I was even questioning myself on that. And I did not like the answer that I was giving myself. Mm. I was like, mm, I don't, I don't know if, if someone like, if someone big and bad were just, you know, if someone came at me, like, I, I don't know if I could, I don't know if I could really protect myself and my family. And so that, that caused me to, that in that, that really motivated me to change the way I teach to where I'm not teaching. Sorry, let me rephrase. That cha- challenged me to change the way I execute my martial arts. So I started putting better, m- more context in something. You know, like if I'm in a class and the instructor says, all right, you know, execute, execute a roundhouse kick. Then now when I'm throwing a high roundhouse kick, I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm going to throw this high roundhouse kick because I'm working on the showmanship of it. Yes, I'm kicking the head, but I'm also really working on, again, how it looks in a form. If I'm throwing a body level roundhouse kick, okay, now I'm working on the sparring application in a controlled setting. But if I'm throwing a low roundhouse kick, okay, now I'm attacking the legs. I'm chopping down the tree, so to speak. Now this is in a real world self-defense application. Same with the sidekick and all that kind of different stuff, right? So um, now because I start, when I started putting it in that context, that helped me start to really communicate context to my students so that they don't ever feel like not to say that it's not going to happen but at least i set them up for a better chance of not feeling inadequate about their own martial arts skills and abilities Hmm. especially if they're a high especially if they're at a high rank like black belt yeah yeah Yeah. a lot of schools i guess i'll say struggle because the instructor has a mindset that is one or maybe two of those, you know, three angles. And if a student doesn't quite resonate with that, they often go elsewhere. You know, if they come in, if they're, you know, they're, they're really focused on competition in the school, you know, they, maybe they don't even discourage competition, but they're just like, yeah, you know, that's cool. Have fun. Doesn't click. Do you think that you build better relationships with your students or have better retention or, or anything from having that more re- well-rounded view? I think so. Um, I mean, my students have been, um, now obviously you have students that come and go, right. Sure. Um, as you know, but, um, as far as retention with my students, I mean, I have, I have some students that have been with me since 2013, 2014. You know, um, nice. they've been with me a long time. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, um, you know, it's, you know, it's, um, and even the ones that are no longer with me, um, <clears throat> they, I'm sure they've, they, they've hone in on and, and, and remember the, some of the lessons that I, I've given them. Um, <clears throat> but now I'm forgetting the actual question, Jeremy. <laughs> what was the question again? It was around retention. I, I, because w- the way you thoughtfully talked about it, I suspect that if I was to hang out and train with you guys for a few months, I would see it in your curriculum. Oh, And we have a lot of school owners who pay attention to this show. And I'm wondering if for some of them, embracing the one or the two of this trichotomy that they don't put time into would be better, not only for them, but for their students. Sure. No, absolutely. Um, you know, I think if you give people the whole picture and you give it in like bite-sized pieces, then it helps them appreciate what they're doing. Hmm. So again, like, I'm just going to continue to use the sidekick example, right? Yeah. Um, as we know, any, any high level practitioner knows that 
the higher you bring a kick, the more vulnerable you are. And so, but that is common sense to us now. But for a new student, a white belt, you know, the beginning ranks, that's not common sense. Those are epiphanies. And so I think oftentimes when we are training in martial arts, like especially for those of us that have done it for a long time, like these, these things that are common sense to us, we forget that they were once epiphanies. And so um, we can't assume that, hey, all right, our students know to that even though they would throw a body sidekick uh, in competition or even just training in the dojo, we can't assume that they know, hey, in self-defense, kick low. Um, at least that's how I teach things, right? You know, and um, on the rare occasion, may, you might kick higher. But, um, and I think um, part of it is because I think I think part of the reason why schools in general maybe have a hard time transitioning that methodology or that knowledge is because maybe they're so focused on the next tournament. And, and I'm a fan of tournaments. I'm a fan of competing. We compete. Um, mm-hmm. But we, we know that there are tournaments practically every weekend. Um, and we're not a school that participates in tournaments every weekend. We don't even do tournaments every month. Um, we pick a handful. I, I pick a handful of, of, of tournaments and I usually pick the tournaments that um, I have rapport with the promoter, um, you know, and, and they are, um, there's a good connection. In other words, I pick the tournaments that I feel I could stand behind the promoter. Right. Um, and yeah, but that's, a, that's another topic. Um, and so I, I am a, a proponent of, training students for competition but if we only teach them with a competition mindset and not a a self-defense application a self-defense mindset then uh, we're doing a disservice to our students now the benefit of them doing competition of course is it builds confidence it it builds teamwork right even though martial arts is an individual sport we all do it together we're there at the competition we're enjoying each other's company we're getting to know each other more that's a cool dynamic that happens um, but just because a student is good at competition doesn't mean he's good at defending himself. So then on the flip side, though, then there are other schools that solely train for self-defense. And while that's great, if you remove the competition aspect from it, then I think we steal away that, that desire for us to, um, win at something everybody wants to win at something you know and um yeah everybody wants to win at something so if you if you don't allow students to even just have friendly healthy controlled competition then and you're only training for self-defense real world then i think not only are you stealing that away but you're also i think you're also um taking out the peace aspect that comes from martial arts. Hmm. Yeah. 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 The more you're talking about, the more I'm seeing the overlap, the synergy between them. For example, I've heard myself say a number of times, there's no better way to condition uh, performance under pressure than competition. Right. And if you want to be able to perform under pressure in a self-defense situation, it's it's not a bad element to have worked within because you're probably not going to get injured. It's hard to go intensely enough with friends that you've trained with for years such that you are afraid in a safe way, right? Like it's, when you step out in front of a bunch of strangers, most of us feel that, uh, feel a little bit of a butterfly sensation. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I just competed in a tournament a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, and I mean, I still compete. (laughs) And, and that was one where, man, my heartbeat is still, you know, still (laughs) pitter pattering, right? I'm like, man, when's this going to end? (laughs) <laughs> like, you know, I mean, never. 
Probably never. Exactly. Because you care. Because you care about the outcome. Absolutely. You want to put in your best effort and you recognize that it's up to you to put in your best effort. Yeah. And you know what? Honestly, like, I, I so now, I mean, I enjoy that pitter patter. Um, even though I don't enjoy it, I do enjoy it, right? It's like a love hate relationship. I totally understand. You totally understand. Yeah. I do. Because when your heartbeat is doing that, first off, it's not nervousness, it's adrenaline that's pumped through your body, right? But a lot of people think, oh, I'm nervous. No, that's your mind lying to you. That's your mind lying to you, you know? Um, and, but that, that feel lets me know I'm growing, I'm moving forward, I'm changing, mm -hmm. right? Because everything happens, ev growth happens outside of your comfort zone. If you're not feeling that pitter patter, you're in your comfort zone. And so you're going to stay stagnant because we're never, Great. right? We're never staying status quo. You're either moving forward or you're regressing. You're going backwards in life. Simple as that. Well said. Mm -hmm. So what's coming next? What's going on for you and your training and your school and everything over the next few years? Yeah. So um, in the in the recent years, um, recent couple of years. So you know, I grew up doing a. Even though my students call me sensei, and I, we do a lot of like Japanese. Well, we don't we speak English in class? We like we don't count in Japanese or anything like that. But um, like my background is is, is taekwondo, uh, and and so I know a lot of the. You're uh, one of those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a taekwondo so, stylist with Japanese terminology. Yeah, right. No, <laughs> well, and then, but then now, but what's funny is, I remember when I would take a taekwondo class, be in a taekwondo class, because you know my dad has tongsudo background. So really, what that is is that's just Korean Shotokan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so I remember being in that taekwondo class which was WT style, right? You know, yeah. World Taekwondo Federation style. And um, I remember the way I would do my forms, my says, you know, it was, it was not to Taekwondo standards as they would call it. It was too karate-ish. And I'm like, okay, whatever. But uh, once, once I broke away from any kind of, you know, real um, federation, like that. I mean, I am part of a, a federation now, the United States Black Belt Federation, USBBF, and um, <clears throat> which is great. Um, but I just was like, as I was growing up, okay, my, my kicks are like Taekwondo based. Um, and I love doing Taekwondo forms with like this karate element to it, um, mm -hmm. where, you know, a little more intense and structure. But then, um, I lately over the past couple of years have been picking up more um, Japanese forms and um, I just love to pivot like at a tournament I'll do if they have a Korean division and a Japanese division I'll do both of those I'll hmm. still do I'll still do open forms or creative forms I'm not I'm not one of those trickers I'm not going to do the you know the 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 the, the um, extreme forms I'm I'm yeah that's, I wish I had gotten into that earlier on in my journey. You could still um, do it. I've seen you move. Yeah. You could do it. Yeah. <laughs> um, my mind, well, my heart says yes. My mind says, eh, I don't know. You have a lot of responsibilities. <laughs> so, um, but, uh, but uh, and then I, I, still, I still like to spar and still like to fight when it comes to competition um, every now and then. Um, I, I will do it in class with my students. I'll spar them. And um, I like sparring them because it helps them grow. Like, and I like to, I like to challenge them. And, and I know that with certain students, I know they have a fear of sparring. And so I know my intent and I know where I know my students. So I know how far I can push them without over overwhelming them um but anyhow uh, now i'm just kind of going on a tangent but to get back to your question i was like what's next what am i doing um in addition to um training still i'm not really going to compete too much i'm going to kind of take a little bit of a, a pause with competing maybe one here and there um 
but I had done a lot of tournaments last year um, because so many of them due to COVID were available virtually as well as in person. Right. Um, my son and I, he and I both did like 18 to 20 tournaments last year, um, which is a lot for us compared to doing like two to three typically. Yeah. So um, it was a lot. Uh, and, and I found myself, it was a fun experience. It was really cool. I enjoyed it. Won some awards. That was great. And, um, but I found myself getting, um, to, lost in the results, you know? And, um, so I'm like, okay, I'm just going to pull off from that for a little bit and just kind of, kind of go back to compete. Like when I compete, it's just going to be because it's just going to be because it sounds fun, right? Um, I'm not going to the Olympics, so I don't need to go all crazy. Um, I just need to set a good example of what it looks like to win humbly as well as what it looks like to lose humbly mm-hmm. and respectfully. Yeah. Um, and um, But as far as what's going on in terms of like training, I'm actually pivoting a little bit mm-hmm. and um, I'm training for a triathlon. Cool. So, yeah, my first one. Why? And because uh, I'm crazy. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Even my, crazy people have reasons, Matt. Yeah, yeah. No, honestly, it's because. Um, so, what actually started was, um, I had ma- alluded to earlier that uh, my my uh, three areas that I find I get rest and rejuvenation from. And, you know, my spirit, my spirit gets refueled is uh, martial arts, music, and running. I have, uh, I have taken, I had taken up running over, over my adulthood. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll be honest, this is, I'll be honest, when I was a kid, I was, I would look at those that would run and I'd be like, you're running for fun. You're weird. And, uh, I just, I didn't relate. And that was part of my immaturity at that time. And then, um, you know, my health, when I, when I mentioned earlier about my health journey and me getting on this, you know, health journey, I started to run not because I liked it, but because I wanted the results that came from it. Um, because I knew that, Hey, I would, I would slim down. I would, you know, get at a more ideal fitness level for me personally. And, um, so then I started, so I started to run there. Well, then it became one of those things where I got that natural high, the endorphins kick in. And, um, that's where I just found I could clear my head. And so, um, I would now consider myself a runner, you know, and, um, but you don't say the J word around me, the J word jogging. You're going for a jog. Don't say that. <laughs> no, it's a, it's a run. And any, any runner, anybody that listens to this that also runs knows what I'm talking about with that distinction between runner and jogger. <laughs> but um, um, but recently, um, I had bought a road bike, and uh, you know, I had a mountain bike. I have a mountain bike, and you know, it's something I'll ride with my son and whatnot. And uh, but I just wanted a road bike. I just wanted to, you know, just you know, get a little little low, little aerodynamic, and just go go fast. Right. Mm. Like in, like in a, in the movie, Talladega Nights, Ricky Bobby, I want to go fast. I want to go fast. <laughs> um, good. Good um, movie. So good. So good. Um, so I bought a road bike and that, that just kind of got me thinking, I'm like, you know, I could probably do a, a dual athlon where you run and bike. And then I was just kind of looking them up and I'm like, you know what? I could swim. I'm not fast. <laughs> I'm not a very strong swimmer in my opinion, but Hey, I could, I could do that. Yeah. Let me, and then, uh, how, what, what really got me going was I got some promo email about a discount for a triathlon and I'm like, Oh, you're speaking to an Asian here. Discount. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's go. <laughs> let's and, and, uh, and so I started talking to my wife about it and, and she goes, why do you want to do that? 
And why do you want to do a triathlon? She goes, that doesn't sound fun at all. I'm like, yes, it does. And she's like, no, it doesn't. I'm like, to me, it does. And she's like, to me, it doesn't. I'm like, okay, why do you want to do it? And I'm like, because I can. That's really what it comes down to. And, and I just want to know that I can because it's something I've never done before. I, 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 in 2015, I ran my first half marathon. And the reason why I did that was because I wanted to challenge myself in something that's different. And, and I also gave myself at that time, I gave myself a time based off of, you know, my, you know, pace per mile. I said, okay, I'm going to run a sub 145, right. Uh, uh, you know, run my half marathon in under an hour and 45 minutes. And I think, um, my, my time, my first one, I was at an hour and 42 minutes, um, and some seconds or whatever. And so for this, you know, there's obviously different distances with a triathlon and I'm choosing to go with the, what's called a, a, a sprint. And, um, and so this is going to be a swim in, in, in a lake, I believe. And then, um, you know, uh, so I think 300 meters. So I think that's what that is. I have to look at the distance again. And then, um, uh, basically a seven and a half mile bike ride and a 3.1 mile run. Mm. Um, and I'm like, all right, my goal, yes, I want to finish, which is why I'm not going with some crazy distance, right? Someone's asking me, are you going to do like the Ironman? I'm like, I'm not going that distance. I think the swim alone is like 2.4 miles. Yeah. The run is a, is a full marathon and then yeah. biking is like 70 miles or something. Like, it's crazy. It's insane. Yeah. And I'm like, and I don't have the training time for that either. I'm mindful of that, which is one of the reasons why I didn't choose a, a longer distance. Um, so I'm realistic about how much time I have to train. So not only do I want to finish because that, that pivot from going, that transition from going from bike ride to running, um, I found out they call that the brick. And the mm. reason why is because your legs feel like bricks. They feel like they feel jello. You feel like you're going nowhere. It's, it's a hard transition for the first couple of miles. And, uh, and, and, and it's said you need about a mile and a half to two miles before things start to feel normal when you're going. And I'm like, okay, wow. <laughs> um, and so, but I do have a time goal set based on it. Like I'm giving myself, okay, I'm going to try and I'm going to, I'm going to do my best to get this in under 70 minutes, probably 65 is what I'm going for. Um, We'll see. We'll see how it goes. It all really depends on how. It really depends on my swim, and uh, and whatnot. But that's that's my goal. Nice. And so that happens. Yeah, that'll happen at the beginning of October. I love it. I, I love the perpetual attitude of, of of pushing yourself, of doing something new. You know, it's it's not martial arts, but it's still white belt mentality. Yeah, I really applaud that. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. If people want to get a hold of you, they want to learn more about your school or you, email, social media, websites, anything you're willing to share? Yeah, uh, website. Um, so my school is Erland 3D Martial Arts, right? The three D stand for determined, dedicated, and disciplined. Um, and so um, they can visit team3dma.com um, if they want to uh, check out the website. Social media on Facebook, it's at team 3dma but on instagram it's at erilyn 3dma so erilyn spelled e as an echo r o l i n as in november and then the number three and then dma but uh erilyn 3d martial arts you know i uh obviously i train people mostly here in southern california but i do have um a student that i train in alaska as well as texas cool and uh, and one that i every now and then will I'll train that lives actually in um, the Connecticut area. Oh, nice. So, yeah. So a fun challenge, I'm sure. Oh yeah. You know it. Absolutely. But you know, that's the beauty of technology, right. you know, zoom and things like that. You know, you can, you can, uh, it has, it has brought a global world. It has brought a mm -hmm. world at your fingertips. <laughs> yeah. The world's gotten a lot smaller. Yeah, Totally. What 
last words you want to leave the audience with? Mm. Well, at, at a certain point in time, you're going to, you're going to feel maybe run down in your martial arts journey. You're going to question like, all right, do I want to continue? And I just remember hearing this quote that said, it's never too late to start. It's always too soon to quit. I've shared with my students many times. I've done, I've done multiple, you know, activities and whatnot, but martial arts is the one sport or activity where those that practice it are glad that they do. Those that used to practice it wish they had continued or they, well, they wish they continue. So therefore they oftentimes get back into it. And those that never had an opportunity to do it, wish they did. I have met hundreds of people that when I've talked to them and they said, oh man, you teach martial arts. Oh man, you do martial arts. Oh, I wish I had done that when I was younger. Or, oh man, I, I, I used to do that when I was younger. I wish I had continued. I have never met one person once in my years, 27 years plus doing martial arts. I've never met someone once that said, oh, you do martial arts? I used to do that. I'm so glad I quit. Not once has anybody ever said that to me. And, um, and so I would say, you know what? Just continue on the journey. You may just need to re you know, find again what inspires you, what motivates you. But at the end of the day, right, you know, motivation comes from outside. Inspiration comes from, sorry, I'm sorry, inspiration comes from the outside. But at the end of the day, you have to motivate yourself. Motivation comes internally. And so there's a, a saying that I always say, me motivates me. Now that's a double meaning because not only am I referring to, you know, me motivating me, but my initials, Matt Erlin, spell me. So the words I have for people, the audience would be, yes. You say to yourself, me motivates me, as in you, you motivate yourself. But I'm telling you, me, Matt Erlin, motivates you. What a great episode. I like Matt, if you can't tell. I think he's a great guy. He's a wonderful martial artist. He's a kind person. And getting to know him better only reinforced that. Renchi, thanks for coming on the show. I appreciate you. Hope to see you again soon. Listeners. Check out the show notes, look at the videos, look at the links, go check out his school. He does cool stuff. And even if you're not in the area, it doesn't mean you shouldn't be aware of what he's doing. If you want to stay aware of what we're doing, make sure you're on the newsletter list. You can sign up at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We'll even throw you a one-time discount for all the things at whistlekick.com. So you can check that out too. If you want to help us in other ways, buy something, uh, Patreon reviews, sharing episodes, or inviting me to come to your school to teach a seminar. Let's do it. Let's do it. We'll have a ton of fun. I promise. If you have topic or guest suggestions, general feedback, email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. And our social media, it's at whistlekick. That's all for now. Until next time, train hard, smile. Can you hear me smiling? And have a great day.